Okay, so no, I told you I would go off script and <laughs> just get inspired by the film again. And this time what struck me so much was how honest you were about so many issues, about how hard it is to do this kind of work and have a personal life, about issues of corruption that everyone ends up dealing with that does this kind of work. Um, and I just wanted to ask you about what you learned about that in yourself as a change maker yourself making films in terms of balancing your own life and how women balance their lives, that in particular. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, it was sort of not something that I had planned when I set out to make this film was to tell that deeply personal side and look at the sacrifices that the women had made. But it was so clear, you know, as we were traveling and spending weeks with these women on the road, and especially with Sister Fa when we went to Germany and met her daughter, what a tremendous sacrifice that they had all made. Um, and I think it, it made me reflect a bit as a young activist and filmmaker thinking about the life that I want to lead. And, um, you know, I think it's something that everyone deals with, but I'm glad that it, that's something that resonated with you when you saw it. So thank you. Can you tell us just a little bit about the, these amazing four women, how they're doing now, what they're doing now, if there's big changes in their lives or work? Yeah, well, so Shohini, the dance therapist, she has just sent me an update this week about two of the women who have gone through her program that were featured in the film. So Julan is one of the senior dance movement therapists who goes into the shelter home, and she's now running a training program for dance therapy. So she is working with younger survivors who want to become dance therapists and going out into shelter homes in rural parts of West Bengal. And Meharaz, the woman right at the end who made Shohini cry, which always makes me cry when I watch it too, um, she is now a professional dancer and she's working with Malika Saraba, who is a really well-known dancer in India. So when we saw her in rehearsal the first day, your eyes just immediately go to her because she's such an incredible performer. And of course she has a really incredible personal story, but um, so I was thrilled to learn that this week. And the other women are all doing well as well. Um, Panmela is continuing to work in Brazil and travels all over the world creating graffiti art. And she started a new program for black graffiti artists, black women graffiti artists in Brazil. Um, they, of course, deal with similar issues of racism as we do in North America. Um, so she is doing the very similar to work to what you saw in the film. Anna continues to grow her business. She sells in Dillard's department stores. You can buy her stuff online at judithandjames.com. Um, she has started a new training program on the coast in Kenya. So she is now working with not only the group that we showed in the film in Nairobi, but in a completely different part of Kenya. Um, and Sister Fa also continues to tour and do very much similar work, although she's now started to work in the African diaspora. So she is starting to see more and more as she lives in Berlin that um, girls are being taken back to their home countries on holiday to be cut. So she's trying to raise awareness throughout Europe and in the UK and even in the US about genital mutilation. So they're hard at work, nothing's changed. That, that's really inspiring. Um, Alana, I was really inspired when I talked to you about how the American Jewish World Service finds people to work with on the ground in all of its places. And I'm just curious, I'd love you to talk about that and also how you have dealt with the issue sometimes of corruption, which happens in every country and trying to avoid that, dealing with what happens and then keeping your faith and, and your forward movement when that inevitably happens every country in the world. Excellent. So first of all, I'm so glad to be here, and I'm so glad to be sitting next to the producer of the movie. That's amazing. Um, so I think one of the things that I was attracted to AJWS uh, at the very beginning is the fact that we don't go in and tell people what they need. So we won't go and say, you know, you need a school, we're going to build you a school, or you need a hospital, we're going to build you a hospital. And as you can hear from my accent, I come from the country that created colonialism. So... Um, it was very refreshing, and the way in which we do this, in each of the 19 countries we work, we have an in-country consultant, sometimes more. In a country as big as India, we have five. These are locally born people 
who are community activists and have a high level of credibility. And it's their job to identify organizations that fit within the work that we do, who are about to make a leap, who with a certain amount of resources could take a huge step in their goals and their vision. And we're also a first funder for many organizations. And often I think to get an organization like HAWS on your resume as an organization is really huge for people. Um, so I think that's the most important thing is that we hear from within the country what's needed and we hear from the groups what they want. And it's not a question of us telling people. In terms of corruption, it's a big challenge. Co corruption is a currency in the developing world. And we obviously as, an, as a 501c3 cannot endorse that and we cannot work with that. So we are often stuck, or rather our grantees are often stuck not being able to progress on certain things and we can help them through the legal courts. Uh, we can help them uh, get in, uh, going through the media and trying to exploit. At the moment, you probably heard in India, there is a major war against corruption. So there's an opportunity there for our organizations to move forward because they can publicize those who are being corrupt and holding them back. But it's a huge challenge anywhere. I'm gonna ask Catherine a question. I just wanna let you know, after Catherine answers, I'm gonna open it up for questions from the audience. But um, Catherine has an amazing background in the arts. I was really happy to see that she was actually the person that curated the art in the new San Francisco Main Library when it opened, among other things. I've seen her work all over, but, and you know, I'm an artist myself and I believe in art, but do we really know it can help make social change? And what do we know about that? What do you know about that? Well, I mean, I, you know, given my background, absolutely believe in the transformative power of art um, to advance social change, absolutely. Um, I like to say that storytelling is activism um, and art is activism. And I think that um, we see this um, so beautifully, actually, in, um, in Sophie, in your film, um, in Little Stones. Um, I think it is operating on a couple of levels. I mean, one is that the film itself um, is an incredible piece of activism, of art for activism and um, changing the mindsets and um, creating awareness among audiences. And then in the film, you know, we have the opportunity to meet these incredible four women who are artists and creators. And through their stories, we see the individual transformation um, that art is happen having on the lives of women. Um, we see the women, um, in many cases, um, for the first time finding themselves, seeing themselves as leaders and being seen by others as leaders. And then um, we see the, um, in the case of, of um, you know, Penmela and in the case of, um, I would say, um, Sister Fa, um, the transformation that can happen when um, art is used as, um, as sort of a tool and as a, as a method of reaching new audiences. And so we do know that these, you know, that, these, um, that this can have impact. Um, it has impact on um, awareness change. It has impact on um, transforming um, cultural norms and attitudes that are so you know, rooted um, in, um, in culture. And I mean, it can inspire audiences and new people to get involved in the movement. So on so many levels, we know <laughs> that there's an impact. Yeah. Right, that's really true. It reminds me of the line that someone says in the film that if culture, this culture of holding women back is universal, then culture can change culture. And that, that was a really lovely line. Anyone else have, anyone have questions? I think we have a microphone going around. So we have a question in the center here. I have a question for Sophie. Uh, how did the movie come about? Did you, had you heard the stories about these women and then they decided to make the film or in verse? Um, well, it started with Shohini. So I had a friend, oops, put this here. Um, I had a friend who, who did a Fulbright in India and she came back and told me about this woman who is using dance to rehabilitate sexual trauma survivors. And I had been a dancer from when I was really little. When I was two years old, I remember taking ballet classes through graduating from college. And I think it just resonated, the idea that dance, I knew the power that dance had had in my life um, and to sort of work through emotional trauma. And so, you know, it really just resonated for me that, of course, how else, how better to learn to love your body and get back into your body again than um, through the joy of dance and movement. So that was the, the initial spark, and then it was 
a huge research project, really, in figuring out who the other women would be in the film once I had been introduced to Shohini. Um, and it became a question of diversity in every sense of the word. So geographic diversity, issue diversity, art form diversity, personality diversity. Pamela is so tough and Shohini is such a warm tiger mom and Anna's um, you know, so young and, and hopeful. So wanting to have that, that cast of characters too that could show all the different sides of what activism looks like. Another question. Oh, so we have a question over here on your left. Um, I thought it was really interesting at the point when um, I think it was the, the singer started to talk, or no, there were organizations doing work in Africa and there was a talk about how, uh, yes, we appreciate the impact on children and education, but we need to go to the elders and sort of change their mindset. Um, or what she's doing, coming into a village once every year is not going to make the true t change. Did any of your activists talk about um, steps for creating larger sort of systematic change? You know, how can they tap into public policy or where does politics play a role? Or I'd, I'd be curious if any of, the, if any of those conversations came up. Um. I mean, certainly they're all, not, none of the women that we filmed are working alone. So that's something that's really hard to capture is how Shohini, for example, is not at all involved in the rescue process. She's going into shelter homes after girls have been rescued. But there's, of course, incredible organizations that work with the legal department, with, um, with police officers to rescue girls. So in, they're very complex issues. So, of course, everybody needs to be working together. Um, the criticism, though, I mean, I, I think it's interesting because, you know, with Sister Fa in particular, there was a, a fair amount of sort of grassroots criticism of her work. Um, but then when you're there, it's sort of undeniable just how inspiring it is to have someone come into your community and to come into your classroom and to work with you for the day and to see how excited the kids were and how different this was. And just a window into the world outside their village. Um, you know, I, I think I feel torn. I think she's doing incredible work at the international level and in raising awareness. Um, but I also think that some of those criticisms are valid, which is why we put it in the film. But I'm curious to know if you guys have further thoughts on that. We saw in the movie here, in the documentary, uh, Molly Melchin from Tostan, which is one of the organizations we supported. And Molly has a multi-pronged um, approach to it. It's not a one size fit all for any village or any community or any, any uh, country. Um, certainly, she spoke about the power of women who had been cut. Um, not the necessarily elders women, but, but women who were of childbearing age and, and, and middle age. And that these women, particularly as they started to enter into the stage of being leaders of the community, had a fundamental role to play. But certainly, many of the work we do, um, we do see that the power of the young people and the power they have of the internet which connects them and helps them find their rights is an incredibly exciting prospect. And I would add to that, I mean, we certainly see, so at Global Fund, oh, sorry, <laughs> is that better? Um, at Global Fund for Women, we're both um, uh, grant makers and advocates for women's rights. And um, we, you know, similar to um, American Jewish World Services, um, you know, are funding um, grassroots um, women-led organizations in country. And what we find, there are many, many factors to, you know, um, uh, advance um, social change. And so uh, Shohini and Kolkata Salvat is one of our longtime um, grantee partners. And using that example, um, you know, she is working very much, of course, on um, individual awareness and personal transformation. Um, but she works in, um, in conjunction with and collaboration with um, numerous other um, organizations in her community. So organizations that are working to change laws and policies around trafficking. And um, we also know that um, access to services um, and awareness, so both on the individual and the um, societal level, there are a number of factors and change is most successful when, when groups are working together in that way. Yeah. Anyone else? Looks like in the back over there. Yeah, another question here in the center. Oh, center. How would you rate San Francisco with human trafficking 
Um, I heard that it was number three in the world. Anyone want to jump in on that? Anyone? No? The one thing I can say is wherever you have a port, you have uh, human trafficking. And we have three ports uh, in the Bay Area. And that, so we are incredibly susceptible to it. And I think it's been a big wake-up fall for us all, the fact that it's happening in our backyard. And I hope it's something that everybody will feel really empowered and encouraged. If we can't stop it in our backyard, how can we stop it elsewhere? Well, good question. Thank you. And anyone else? Another one in the center. Okay. Thank you. A beautiful film, really powerful, and, and I felt like I really got to know each of the characters in the film. How long did it take you to film, and what's the planned life for the film now that it's finished? This was a four-year process that in some ways feels like it's just getting started. Um, you know, we started researching and filming back in 2014 at New York Fashion Week actually was our first shoot and finished production and post-production on the film last fall and had our film festival premiere earlier this year. Um, but, you know, we're, we're just starting to get it out into the world. So we partnered with the University of Michigan School of Education to create eight incredible lesson plans and workshops of how you can use poetry and graphic design in the classroom, and that's geared toward high school students and undergraduate students. And we've also created discussion guides and a take action resource guide, which is essentially, we're not going to invent any resources that already exist, but let's say you're a dance therapist and you'd like to start working in a shelter home, or you're a shelter home director and you wanna start bringing in dance therapists to your organization, that exists, the American Dance Therapy Association has an incredible directory and we want to just direct people towards that. So all of those materials are gonna be launching the first week of September. And we're also, we have a couple samples here, so I encourage everybody to stop by Art Attack SF, which is a gallery right around the corner. And you can flip through some of our lesson plans and um, sort of get a feel for those materials and what they're going to look like. And then please, please join our mailing list. So littlestones.org and just sign up with your email and you will get an update and you can forward that on to any teachers or professors that you know um, when those materials are available. And one of the thing you spoke of that I found so interesting is your thoughts about maybe a television series based on Little Stones. Could you say <laughs> a few words about that? Sure, so I think, I, personally I'm not done with this material. I think the more of these stories that you learn and in the process of making the film, the more I came in touch with incredible photographers and artists and other people who are using art really in an innovative way to create change around women's issues. Um, so I think it would make a great TV series. So keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> we will watch for it. Anyone else out there? We have one more question back here on your left. Hi. Hi, this is not really a question, but we're kind of quiet, I notice, as an audience. And I just want to tell you, speaking for myself, it, I just loved your film. I mean, really loved your film. Could have watched another hour of it. I think it's uh, extremely well done. I think you're really talented. And I hope you don't quit for years to come. And I think this idea of, 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 of following the work for women through the arts is a brilliant, brilliant idea. And uh, maybe we'll f even figure out about tra human trafficking in the Bay Area uh, using some of this. But thank you so much. So sweet, thank you. Someone else is raising their hand, okay. I have so many questions, I'm just <laughs> wanting to jump back in, but. Okay, another one in the center. Well, I just wanted to second that, what you just said. Um, we are quiet, but I am, that was such a very well-made documentary, and thank you so much for you taking action. You inspired me in so many ways, and I teach yoga, and um, I just wanna like go back and even just donate more of my time doing whatever, I'm gonna figure that out. But, um, and I'm joining your mailing list at this second, so thanks again. Thank you. <laughs> and, 
feel free to take out your phones if you want and take any pictures. There has been a slideshow up there. And um, Sophie, do you want to say again your website? Sure. Well, I'd just love to thank the festival organizers for having this day. I mean, normally we wouldn't be programmed, I think, in a festival that's focused on Jewish films, but um, we're so grateful for the opportunity to be at this incredible festival for our Northern California premiere, and also so grateful to have both of you on the panel. Thank you for coming out today. Um, and yes, littlestones.org, and you can join our mailing list, and please forward the trailer um, and the website on to any teachers you know, any professors that you know, anyone who might want to host a community screening. Thank you all so much. Yeah, yeah sir, what, another question. question. Here on your right. Hi, thank you for a beautiful film. I'm wondering why you didn't speak at all about the physical aspect, consequences of female genital mutilation. I, I mean, obviously the traumatic pain, the pain of having it done, but I don't know that most people know that a lot of women have lifelong consequences, incontinence, um, they're shunned by their communities. I mean, it's really, it's, it's even worse than not being able to enjoy sex. It's much worse. So I'm just wondering, was it a question of time or did you think that was like too heavy? Just curious. Um, you know, it's in part, so one of the things that I think I would have loved to include. It was mostly time, and when you're trying to tell four stories, trying to fit as much as you can in to tell a coherent story. But, um, you know, the midwives that we met when we were filming were some of the biggest advocates for ending genital cutting because they're the ones who see that the scar tissue that's created makes it really hard in childbirth. And so they see that the babies often die, the women have a lot of trouble if they've been cut. Um, and so that was sort of something we would have loved to include, but it was this kind of bright speck of hope that there's actually women who are going out in the communities that everyone is cut there. Every single woman you walk in, we would say, you know, do you still practice cutting? And they'd say, oh, no, 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 because it's illegal. No, 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 we don't cut. No one here, we don't cut anymore. We don't do that. And they say, oh, wonderful. Well, can we meet some young girls who haven't been cut? And they just look around and everyone's been cut. So it, it was definitely, you could see what sort of Sister Fowl was up against and what she's, the odds that she's trying to, you know, beat. But at the same time, then you meet these midwives who are the most passionate advocates for ending it, despite their whole community being for it. We have a little more time, right? Okay, I had dying to ask Alon something. So this is a Jewish film festival, and I know your organization as well works isn't out there working with Jewish groups, particularly around the globe. So how are these issues Jewish issues? And how does your organization um, justify that? So if I can disagree with the uh, producer, the honored guest here, and say everything about this movie is Jewish. That, <laughs> that in Judaism, we are commanded to, to pursue peace that we, uh, we are commanded to see people, that all people are born in the image of God, and that we must strive for a, a olam, to fix the world. And I don't think that Judaism would be Judaism if it wasn't for that commitment that we all have to social justice. And it's not enough just to help Jews. In our organization, we're not even helping Jews. These are Jews reaching out to the poorest and most marginalized people in the world. And that is our obligation, to create a better world for all. Well said, well said. Um, and, you know, I'm interested in everyone's spiritual connection to this. I don't, I'm putting you on the spot here, Catherine, but um, anything that you want to add about how your own spirituality, your faith community inspires your work? Well, I haven't been asked that question on, <laughs> on stage before, but it's actually, um, it, it's a wonderful one. I, um, you know, I came from... Um, uh, a family, a Catholic family, very committed to um, social justice. Um, my father was um, involved, um, you know, in the 1960s on the war on poverty. He was an economist and a community organizer himself and was involved in the war on poverty and then um, worked with um, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta to help form the, um, the credit unions um, that the farm workers were able to um, 
uh, start in order to become um, economically sustainable individually and as a community. So I think it was, um, you know, very much came from a faith-based place in my family and um, very much around um, sort of a social justice lens. So I think that that, you know, I know that that has always inspired my um, my activism, and for me as someone who comes from, um, you know, professionally came from the art world, it was the moment about 10 or 15 in years into my career when I had the opportunity to marry my passion for art and media um, with social justice and to do that on behalf of um, uh, advancing rights for women globally that um, I just felt like, wow, what an incredible opportunity to have this, um, you know, this, this opportunity in my career. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Sophie, anything, where does your inspiration come from? My inspiration? Well, I will say I'm Jewish, so I completely agree with you. <laughs> um, although, I'm, I'm glad you see the film also as reflecting that. You know, I think it was really interesting. I, I don't know if anyone picked up on this, but Anna comes from a very religious Christian upbringing. Um, and... At first, it, it, I sort of felt like, oh, we don't have anything in common. You know, I was raised Jewish, and she's very Christian. But um, I think there's just so much room for commonality. It became really clear as I got to know her that there is so much overlap in the kind of work that we're both interested in and the change that we want to make. So um, it's nice to be showing this film, actually, in a, more of a faith community. And I hope that we can continue to do that, because I think there's within Judaism as well as Christianity, there's a lot of opportunity to deal with these issues and people really um, seem to want to engage with it and it resonates. So um, in terms of inspiration, I think I've always loved to read and I've always loved stories, written stories. I was never a big movie buff. I think that's what's so funny to my family that I became a filmmaker because I haven't seen, I just saw Jurassic Park for the first time this year. So I'm really not a movie buff, but, um, I think that like love of characters and love of stories and um, really strong woman characters. I just I remember reading every Little House on the Prairie book when it came out, and um, you know, so I think that would be where my storytelling inspiration would come from. That's really lovely. Well, I think that I got to wrap it up about now. But um, thank you all so much for coming, and thank you all so much for coming. Thank you.